uh, our last session. And the first speaker is uh, Shota Komatsu from Geneva, and he will speak about categorical symmetries and scattering amplitudes. Please, 15 All right. minutes. Okay. Thank you for introduction, and then thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, and then thank you for organizers for organizing a great conference. So yes, today I'm going to talk about one uh, physics application of categorical symmetries, uh, in particular on scattering amplitudes. So, so this is a work that I wrote uh, together with Christian Copetti in Oxford and Lucia Cordova uh, in CERN uh, in the beginning of this year, and I'm also going to mention work in progress. Okay, so let's start. So let's start uh, mentioning about my affiliation. So I'm at CERN. So as you probably know, uh, CERN is a big uh, experimental facility uh, in, at the border, border of Switzerland and France. And so what they do here uh, is that uh, you, they accelerate particles to very, very high energy, and they collide them or smash them and then measure, in, measure the outcome. So what do they, why do they do this? So they want to do this because they want to uh, compare uh, the outcomes of the experiments against theoretical predictions. So what are theoretical predictions? So theoretical predictions uh, are basically made uh, by the computation of quantum field theory, and in particular, uh, the relevant theoretical objects are what's called scattering amplitudes, or for short, sometimes people call it S-matrix. Of course, every physicist know that how to compute uh, scattering amplitudes. Uh, and the typical way of computing scattering amplitudes is drawing this kind of Feynman diagrams. And then, uh, so this allows you to compute probability of a particular given outcome. So this has been studied like uh, since 50s. And, and people found that the scattering amplitudes actually exhibit a very interesting property, uh, I'm, which I'm going to tell you. Uh, that is called crossing symmetry. So what is crossing symmetry? So imagine you scatter particle A and particle B, and then look at the process in which the outcome is, again, particle A and particle B. And this scattering amplitude, or probability amplitude, depends on uh, the total energy of particle A and B, and also the angle of the emitted particles. And what people found through the computation was that if you compute the scattering amplitudes of this process, where A and B particle are uh, colliding here, uh, and then take that object and compute it as a function of uh, energy and angle, and do this appropriate analytic continuation, you can actually compute the probability amplitudes of comp completely different uh, scattering process, in which A and A particle collide, and B and B particle are emitted. So this is what's called crossing symmetry. So this might be a little bit vague, but like, uh, it can be actually converted into a very concrete formula. Uh, in the case of 2 to ampli amplitudes and in simple cases, uh, this basically boils down to this relation. This, what's called S matrix, which computes the probability amplitudes, depend on two uh, complex parameters, S and, S and T, and S roughly measures the energy, and T roughly measures the angle. And the crossing symmetry basically tells you that the, this, this S matrix, uh, with argument S and T, must be equal to this, like other S matrix, which describe the uh, different uh, process uh, in which like a T and S are swapped. So the importantly, uh, in the physical process, S is the energy, so it has to be positive, whereas T, which measures the angle, uh, can be negative. So when you interpret this formula, you also need to uh, do appropriate analytic continuation, because here, originally, S the first argument was supposed to be always positive, but in order to make sense of this formula, you also need to consider uh, this object in which, uh, for which the first argument can also be negative. So that's why analytic continuation is important. Okay, so, so why people are excited about, were excited about this symmetry? So first of all, this is very useful for the computation because you don't need to redo the computation of this process. You can just do the computation of this process and then that automatically spits out the answer for this process. And as I already mentioned, uh, this was first found in the, uh, through the computation uh, already in around 60s, uh, sorry, 50s. And in some cases, rigorous proof of are obtained uh, by these authors and also uh, more recently, uh, people were revisiting uh, this question of proving the crossing symmetry. Okay, so this is the crossing symmetry, 
And let me uh, directly go to the punchline of my talk. So the punchline of my talk is that in the presence of certain categorical symmetries, uh, the crossing symmetry that I just explained uh, is actually modified. So in that case, uh, we found an example in which this is actually not equal to this. And instead, it obeys some kind of modified formula. So let me also explain what I mean by certain. So in my talk today, I'm going to only talk about series in one plus one dimensions, although I make some comments on higher dimensions at the end of my talk. And also, uh, I'm going to focus on specific theory, uh, which are called integrable theory, in order to check the claim that I'm going to make. But the logic applies actually to non-integrable series as well. OK, so let's proceed. So this is the plan of the talk. So I'm going to briefly review for you uh, categorical symmetry in one plus one dimensions. And then I, uh, next I'm going to uh, discuss the particular theory that I'm going to talk about, which is integrable flow from trick critical easing model, and then discuss the S matrix. And then uh, I will present uh, how the crossing symmetry gets modified, and then derive, gives a phys physical derivation of the modified crossing rules using the, uh, basically the structure of the fusion category. Okay, so that's the plan. So let's start with the first bullet point. So as we already heard uh, in several talks in this conference, uh, modern understanding of symmetry is that symmetry based in quantum field theory basically corresponds to uh, D minus one dimensional topological operators. So here I'm talking about what people normally call zero form symmetry, the most uh, canonical example of the symmetry. And in the, in the particular case of one plus one dimension, uh, if you plug D equals two, then you get one dimensional topological operator, so it's a line operator. And so this line operator, because it's topological, you can deform it into arbitrary shape, and in particular, you can also move it in the time direction. So that basically corresponds to the uh, ch conservation of the charges in the usual context of the symmetry. And furthermore, uh, these topological lines can be multiplied, and in particular, in the usual group-like group symmetry, uh, they basically obey the group multiplication laws. And then this GAB should be some element of the group. However, uh, it has been known uh, for a long time, uh, but maybe like a, a physicists uh, have only started to appreciate its power only, maybe only recently. Uh, there are actually generalization of the group, uh, which are still topological operator. And then those are often uh, recently called categorical symmetries. And in one plus one dimensions, it's uh, fully understood and it's described by what's called fusion category. And it, they, these topological line, which are generalization of the gr uh, group-like symmetry, now obeys a little bit different multiplication law. So because here we have a sum and then we have some integer coefficient, uh, which needs to be positive, no, well, non-negative integer. And then this is, of course, uh, known as fusion category, as I already, already said. And now uh, you can ask like, what is the simplest uh, one plus one D system uh, with this categorical or sometimes pe people call no invertible symmetry. And actually like uh, there are like a very, very simple model which exhibits this uh, the fusion category symmetry, uh, which probably Sakura, well, I, I think Sakura already talked about, which is easing model at critical temperature, which people often call easing CFT. So let me just ver very briefly review what they are. So 2D easing model uh, is something many people learned in statistical mechanical course uh, in the university. So the, whose partition function is given by sum over spin. So, and then uh, this beta is the inverse temperature. And we know that when the temperature is high, uh, this 2D easing model is in disordered phase, whereas uh, if the temperature is low, uh, it's in the ordered phase. And then there, there is a known duality transformation which maps the disordered phase and the ordered phase, which is known as kramas wanya duality. And, but this duality at, at generic temperature is the duality between different systems. However, uh, if, if you tune the temp temperature to be the critical temperature, the kramas wanya duality becomes a symmetry uh, because the, this duality maps uh, the theory at TC again to the theory at TC. And however, uh, this symmetry, kramas wanya sym symmetry or kramas wanya duality has an unusual, a little bit unusual feature uh, this can be think, uh, understood by thinking of this 2D easing model as uh, some quantum massive quantum field theory. 
if you interpret this 2D easy model as a massive quantum field theory, uh, in the high temperature phase, we only have one vacuum, whereas in the low temperature phase, we have two vacuum. So what this basically means is that, like this Kramer's one year duality maps two vacua into one vacuum. So it's actually two to one map. So if, we, if I denote like a two vacuum here uh, by plus and minus, then like the map goes like this. Plus is mapped to this single vacuum, and minus is also gets mapped to this single vacuum, whereas this single vacuum here gets mapped to a linear combination of plus and minus. And obviously, uh, this is a two to one map, so it has a kernel. So this is why uh, people often call it non-invertible symmetry. And, and you can also make it very precise. Uh, so here, this is the symmetry of the 2D Ising CFT, which sits at this point. And so this 2D Ising CFT has a Z2 symmetry, which is squared to one. But in addition, there is this Kramas 1S symmetry defect, which is squared to one plus eta. So this is a, a canonical example of fusion category. And you can show that like, uh, this uh, action is compatible with the uh, action that I wrote here. How, so then you can ask, like, uh, maybe we can ask uh, the interplay between the scattering amplitudes and this non-invertible or categorical symmetry in the context of 2D easing CFT. However, it turns out easing CFT was a little bit too simple uh, because if you compute the scattering amplitudes in easing CFT, it's just always minus one. It doesn't even depend on the uh, total energy. So in order to see the non-trivial interplay between the categorical symmetry and the scattering amplitudes, uh, we need to look, look for something uh, more complicated. So the first thing you might try is to deform 2D uh, easing C CFT. However, unfortunately, uh, it is known that if you Kramas one year symmetry, it always gets broken if you do some uh, deformation of the easing CFT. So now uh, we need to look for some different theory. So what will be the simplest non-trivial theory pres preserving this Kramas one year symmetry? Uh, and has non-trivial S matrix. It turns out like a, you, it, you can actually easily find such a theory. Uh, to explain that, like I need to remind you that Ising CFT is the simplest unitary minimal model uh, to, in 2D CFT, so which people often call M34. And the next simplest uh, in this unitary minimal uh, CFT is uh, what's called tree critical Ising CFT, uh, which uh, people often denote by M4,5. And it was pointed out in the literature that actually there is a uh, deformation of the trick critical easing model which preserved this Kramas one year duality, uh, Kramas one year symmetry. So, so in this like uh, trick critical model, uh, there is a, a primary operator what's called phi one comma three, and if you deform the trick critical easing model with uh, plus sign, uh, this model uh, actually flows uh, in the low energy to easing model. And along the flow, all the symmetry of the easing model is preserved. So, so this gives you some non-trivial example in which the kramas one year duality symmetry is preserved. And alternatively, you can also uh, deform the tree critical easing model with minus sign. Uh, but since the deformation parameter is the same, uh, it also preserves the same amount of symmetry. However, uh, slightly non-trivial, uh, one difference from the plus sign is that if you deform it with minus sign, the IR phase, like if you go to the infrared phase, low energy uh, limit, then it becomes uh, basically gapped. And it, it's described by some non-trivial topological quantum field theory rather than a conformal field theory like in this case. And this is basically the uh, flow that, or theory that I'm going to talk about today. But let me uh, also mention that you can also do a similar deformation of easing model, and then that uh, precisely corresponds to the uh, deformation of the critical easing model to the high temperature phase, if you deform it by, with plus sign. And if you deform it with minus sign, uh, you get a low temperature phase, which, is, which has two vacua. Okay, so now uh, I mentioned that in the previous slide that uh, this, uh, trigger, this flow preserved the Kramas one year symmetry or more precisely, like what's called Z2 Tambara Yamagami category. So let me just explain for you the action of the, the, the symmetry on the vacua. So as I said, the, in the IR, we have three vacua. Let's denote, it, uh, denote them by minus, zero, and plus. And a Z2 defect basically, so, so this uh, Z2 Tambara Yamagami category has uh, two important defects. One is a D, Z2 defect eta, 
And uh, this Z2 defect eta basically exchanges this uh, vacuum and then this vacuum. So this is a usual like a flipping action of the Z2 symmetry. Whereas the N defect basically uh, acts in the same way as I explained in the context of uh, easing model. So N defect like maps the um, vacuum in the middle uh, to a linear combination of plus and minus. And then it also maps the uh, vacuum plus to zero and a vacuum minus to zero. So in some sense, like uh, this uh, is a superposition of the disorder and uh, ordered vacua uh, in easing CFD. Well, as far as the action of the symmetry is concerned. Okay. So in passing, let me also make some remark. So, so I present, I explained this uh, like a renormalization group flow of this quantum field theory. And, and then I pointed out that this deformation by five and comma three uh, in the extreme low energy, you have three vacua. And it, this three is, t is actually minimal number of vacua allowed by the categorical symmetry. Uh, that basically means that you need to find the representation of this algebra, uh, which are basically matrices in which all the elements are non-negative uh, non integer. And then the only, the minimal uh, size of the representation uh, that actually, that realizes this algebraic structure turned out to be three. And let me also point out that the similar patterns persist for also for higher minimal models. So if you start from higher minimal models and deform it by minus five one comma three, you go to the uh, next uh, minimal models, whereas if you deform it with plus five one comma three, sorry, if you deform it by minus, with minus, you get uh, uh, gapped vacua, gapped theory with n minus one vacua, whereas like if you deform it with plus sign, uh, you get the next minimal model. Okay, I guess so far so good. So, so now uh, let me uh, focus on the theory that I want to study. So this is the theory that describes this uh, renormalization group flow, starting from the UV triggered local easing CFT to the IR uh, TQFT. So, so this, uh, this deformation actually turned out to have an extra, in extra interesting property, which is, actually, which is called integrability. So let's consider this uh, tree critical easing CFT deformed by minus phi one comma three. Uh, at the UV fixed point, which is described by purely by tree critical easing CFT, uh, there exist infinitely many higher spin currents. And that is simply a consequence of the Virasor algebra because Virasor algebra has, is an infinite dimensional symmetry algebra and most uh, many generate, uh, you can construct many uh, charges uh, which have higher spin, non-trivial spin higher, spin, higher than two. And it was shown by Zamolochkov that uh, these higher spin charges actually survive the deformation. So you can just check that whether this deformation commutes with these higher spin charges. And so this fact actually has a profound consequence as pointed out by these papers. So if you have a quantum field theory which admits some non-trivial S matrix, uh, with higher spin charges, uh, then the S matrix of th this theory actually has a nice factorization property. More precisely, if you consider, for example, three to three scattering amplitudes, like a colliding three particle and then collecting three particle, and that three, uh, three to three S matrix actually can be decomposed into two to two S matrices. So you actually don't need any more information than two to two, than two, to two S matrices. And furthermore, uh, there can be a different ways of factorizing three to three S matrices. And those different ways of factorizing uh, three to three S matrices need to give the same answer. So that imposes some non-trivial relation uh, between different matrix, um, different scattering processes. And that's precisely what people normally call Jan Baxter equation. So this imposes highly non-trivial constraint on this two to two S matrix. Okay. And furthermore, uh, what's remarkable is that imposing unitarity and the cross and symmetry that I already talked about and the Baxter equation, you can almost uniquely determine what is the two to two S matrix in this theory. So this was uh, done uh, in this famous work by Zamolochkov. So let me show you the final four answer for this S matrix. So to explain the final form of the S matrix that Zamolochkov determined, let me just uh, introduce, I need to introduce some notations to explain what the formula means. 
So the important thing uh, in this theory is that, as I said, uh, the theory in the IR has three vacua. And the particles that you scatter, then, like uh, the fundamental particle that you scatter in this theory turn out to be what's called kinks, which is basically excitation interpolating between neighboring vacua. So because of that, uh, if you have a particle trajectory, uh, it always like a, it's always sandwiched between like a two different neighboring vacua. So it's kind of like a natural to uh, put these labels of vacua when you describe the scattering process. So here I introduced a slightly different notation from the previous slides in order to conform with the notation in the literature. So now I'm going to call this vacuum zero and then the middle vacuum one half and then the third vacuum one. And in addition, as I already mentioned, the scattering process, the probability of the scattering process, of course, depends on the total energy, uh, which uh, in two dimension is a single variable uh, with S. And you can all, people often parameterize uh, this S in this way. So M is the particle, mass of the particle, uh, which is already given. So this theta is a kind of like a change of, uh, is the basically what's called rapidity variable, which uh, you can use instead of S. So together with all, like, uh, all these levels, like uh, now S matrix depends on basically five parameters, like uh, these A, B, C, D, uh, label, which label vacua, and then theta, which is a parameter, uh, which parameterizes total energy. And the cross and symmetry uh, and unitarity of these S matrices uh, in this notation uh, takes this form. So, it turns out like in this theta variable, the crossing symmetry just corresponds to theta going to i pi minus theta. And the unitarity, which basically says the uh, probability is conserved in the scattering process, basically means that this, if you multiply these two matrices with argument theta and minus theta, you just you need to get identity. So this is the uh, unitarity relation. So by imposing crossing, which I already wrote, and then unitarity, and in addition, Jan Baxter equation. Here, the Jan Baxter equation also takes a little bit more complicated form because I also need to keep track of the label of the vacua. Uh, then, Zamolochkov basically fixed the uni uh, S matrix unique uniquely up to an overall factor, which uh, is not important for my discussion, into this form. So here, like, uh, it looks complicated, but like uh, these Ds are basically for uh, some number uh, which depends on the uh, label of the vacua, and then for zero and one, it's one, and then d one half is square root of two. And by the way, this also, I, I'm, I, I will come back to this point later, but this also coincides with uh, what people normally call quantum dimensions. Okay, so, so now, uh, as I said, uh, this theory is expected to preserve the Kramas one year symmetry, or Z to Tambari Yamagami, Yamagami category. So we expect that this S matrix determined by Zamolochkov uh, also uh, like a commutes with the categorical symmetries that are there in this theory. But let me just, before going, uh, talking about the symmetry, let me just point out that this S matrix, uh, in order to satisfy the cross and symmetry, like uh, Zamolochkov put this like a uh, slightly unusual factor, uh, which is the ratio of quantum dimension uh, to the power i theta over two pi, and that is going to play an important role in the rest of my talk. Okay, so, so, so we do expect that uh, this S matrix commutes with uh, categorical symmetry, but Zamolochkov didn't check it, so we decided to check it. And it turns out uh, this S matrix, first of all, nicely commutes with the Z2 symmetry, the eta defect. However, it turned out that it actually uh, does not commute with the end defect. So in, or, in order for it to commute with the end defect, it needs to satisfy this equation. But you can just like uh, take that formula by Zamolochkov and then check it, and it turns out this is not equal. So now uh, we are facing a paradox. So it seems like the following four properties are mutually incompatible. So unitarity and crossing and the Ambaxa equation or integrability, which is a Molochkov used to determine this S matrix. So that's, and if you combine those three properties and with categorical symmetry that I just talked about, it seems something is going wrong. So we need to like uh, give up at least one of, the, one of the four properties. So which one should we give up? 
of course, we don't want to give up unitarity because this basically, unitarity is a fundamental property of the theory, which basically means that probability is conserved. What about the uh, integrability and crossing symmetry? Uh, sorry, categorical symmetry. So these are also like a rather well established because you can really check uh, near the conformal field theory point uh, you, uh, in which you know, uh, you know a lot about uh, this theory. So now it seems like the only viable option, uh, available option right now is to give up the crossing symmetry. And it turns out actually, if you give up the crossing symmetry, it's rather easy to find S matrix which satisfy these three properties. And this is the S matrix that satisfies the three properties which is almost the same as the homological S matrix. And the only difference is that I just removed this weird prop, uh, slightly weird looking factor by Zamolochkov, and now uh, it starts to satisfy the uh, like commute with the non invariable symmetry. So it has like uh, all these uh, three properties. However, of course, uh, there is a price to pay. There is a reason why Zamolochkov wanted to put that factor, that is to realize the crossing symmetry. And now that we remove that factor, now the crossing symmetry, it gets modified. So instead of having like a this equals, uh, I, e exactly equals to i pi minus theta, now we have an extra uh, prefactor, uh, which is a ratio of quantum dimensions. So, so far, I only presented our conjecture and then observed that the crossing symmetry is modified in our conjecture. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to explain to you what is the physical origin of this ratio of quantum dimensions and why, we, uh, why this modification is of crossing symmetry is in some sense natural. Okay? So now let's move on to the derivation. So before explaining the derivation, let me just uh, explain to you what are key physical inputs that go into the uh, derivation of this modified crossing. So the first important property is what I already, uh, well, the first important property is that uh, in this theory, particles are basically kinks interpolating uh, between different vacua or neighboring vacua. And from the, in the low energy, uh, which is described by topological quantum field theory, uh, the action of the kink, sorry, the action of a kink on the vacua can be, can be identified with the action of the symmetry line, uh, which in this case, uh, this N line defect. So let me just uh, explain to you a bit more precisely like what I mean by this. Uh, as I said, the particle here are basically uh, the always interpolate neighboring vacua. So if you start from zero, uh, you can go to one half. Or if you can start from one half, you can go either to zero or one. So this must remind you something. Uh, this is actually exactly the same as the action of the symmetry line N on the vacua. So if you act N on zero, then you get one half. But if you act N on one half, you can get either zero or one. So to put it another way, like you can identify the world line of the particle as the symmetry line of N. And the second important input that goes into the derivation is that uh, in this theory, the vacua are in one-to-one -one correspondence with symmetry lines. What I mean by this is that you can, identif I, you can identify z this zero vacuum with one uh, trivial line and one half vacuum with N line and one line with the uh, eta line, then the way this symmetry line acts on the vacua is precisely the same as the, the way you fuse two different line uh, symmetry lines. In mathematical language, like, uh, this is just saying that like, uh, these, uh, the vacua are in the, regu are in the regular representation of the fusion category. And the third important ingredient that, that goes into the derivation is that all the vacua can be obtained from zero by acting symmetry line. So you start from zero, and then if you act N, you get one half. And if you start from zero, and if you act eta line, because eta line swaps this vacu vacuum and this vacuum, you get this one vacuum. Okay, so those are three important ingredients. So with this, uh, let me, uh, so let me, with this, like, let me uh, ex start explaining uh, how to derive the uh, modified crossing. 
But as a warm up, uh, let me derive the action of the symmetry line using uh, these physical inputs. So, so let's consider a pass integral on a very large disk with a boundary condition so that like at, at infinity you got a zero vacuum. And this pass integral, you can think of it as computing the norm of the states, like a zero, uh, states created by zero vacuum. And let's normalize this pass integral to be one. Okay, so this is just, uh, this is just to set the normalization. Uh, now, as I said, other vacua can be obtained by acting symmetry lines on this vacua. So if you want to study the state or norm of the other vacua, I just need to act this uh, line here. So this defines the state and then uh, this defines the norm. However, uh, these other vacua are actually not correctly normalized precisely because the expectation value of this line, the circular line, is not one, and, but it's proportional to the quant what's called quantum dimension. So if you really want to have the normalized uh, state, then you need to divide by the square root of uh, this quantum dimension. Now, with this notation, I can also derive the matrix element of the symmetry lines between normalized states. So if you want to compute the matrix element of L phi, phi defect, uh, on this normalized vacuum state, then basically we just need to consider this network of line and then divide by the normalization of the A state and B state. And using the fusion category, you can also compute this network of line, and then this network of line just gives you the square root of the quantum dimension of the three lines times the fusion coefficient, which is a non-negative integer. And you can see that like a, two of these square root factors nicely cancels out because of the normalization, but you are still left with one square root. So in order to correctly realize the symmetry action uh, on the states, we need to renormalize uh, this symmetry line L phi uh, by dividing it by the square root of the quantum dimension. Okay? So now, let's consider instead a state with a kink in the middle interpolating A vacua and V vacua. So this is a kind of pictorial, like a network notation of the state here. So this V is the word line of the, uh, of the particle which can be identified with the symmetry line as I said earlier. And now, using this picture, and then like a, by completing it into a circle, you can also compute the norm of this state. And if you use the same formula, you get square root of dA, dB, and dV. The same formula here. So here, like a, I'm focusing on a particular case, this fusion coefficient is one. Now, uh, now using this notation, you can also compute the matrix element of phi symmetry line on this state, which contains one kink. And in particular, we can also normalize this, uh, these uh, kink states. Okay? So this leads to uh, this normalization factor coming from uh, a denominator and this network of line. So this is slightly bad way of drawing a network of line, but uh, the important point here is that actually this line V and uh, this line phi are not touching. So in a more proper way of uh, drawing this, like I should put this V line outside. And uh, this object, uh, if you view it from the 3D, then it's nothing but a tetrahedron. And it actually computes what's called F symbol, uh, computes for you what's called F symbol uh, in this fusion category. So this basically means that the action matrix element of this symmetry line L phi on this kink state are basically given by F symbol. And uh, earlier, I said our, our, our new conjecture death matrix commutes with the action of known uh, categorical symmetry, but when this is precisely the uh, action of the symmetry line which we used to check that it commutes with the action of the symmetries. Okay? So now, uh, let's move on uh, to the derivation of the modified crossing and using a similar ingre ingredient. And so this is a three-line summary of why uh, this crossing symmetry is modified. So I'm going to explain more detail in, in the next slide. But let me just uh, first give you a summary. So the three important physical property uh, that leads to the modification is that the IR dynamics is now described by non-trivial topological quantum field theory, as I said earlier. 
And the important thing is that it, it turns out the normalizations of in and out states are corrected by topological quantum field theory. And these corrections turn out to depend on the channel uh, we consider. For example, if you view, uh, consider scattering uh, process in this way or in this way. And this is basically the basic reason why uh, crossing symmetry is modified. So let me just give you, now give you more details. So, so, in, <coughs> so how do we, so in order to talk about the modification of crossing symmetry of S matrix, we first need to talk about S matrix. So how do we derive or define S matrix in quantum field theory? So normally, uh, a typical way of defining uh, S matrix from quantum field theory is to use what's called LSZ reduction formulas, uh, which involve computing some correlation functions, doing the Fourier transformation, uh, looking at the residues at the pole. However, uh, in, the in the theory we are interested in, uh, we are scattering kinks interpolating different vacua, but the operator that creates kink in quantum field theory are generically non-local. And it is a bit, un because of that, it is a bit unclear whether the usual derivation of, it, of the LSZ reduction, especially the part uh, in which you do the Fourier transformation and look at the poles of the uh, momentum space correlation function uh, works in a similar way uh, for these operators. Uh, so we decided to kind of like resort to a kind of alternative uh, way of defining S matrix, uh, which also works in the usual quantum field theory, uh, which is actually discussed in one of the textbooks of quantum field theory in chapter five. And I'm not going to explain to you details about this con construction, but the basic idea is that you, uh, you draw two space-like surfaces, uh, which are separated by time t, and then ta just take some correlation function in position space, and, and then uh, do some manipulation. So it still involves some kind of like a Fourier transformation, but the difference from the LSC reduction is that uh, it does not necessarily require uh, for, for us to look at the poles of the momentum, uh, correlate, momentum, momentum space correlated. So all, so this, the details of this is actually not that important. Uh, the, the only important thing is that you can get the S matrix from certain uh, Lorentzian space-time correlation function. So in other words, like this S matrix is some, given by some analytically continued disk correlators. Okay, so these are like a two, two, two S matrix. And however, there is one important thing to take into account, like, like in the derivation of the symmetry action, uh, we need to take uh, into account the normalization of the states. Uh, so this is a, for example, like if you, if you cut this here, then you have a state which, which are de described incoming particle, uh, which are given by this network of line. And the state that described outgoing particle is also is now given by this network of line. And the norms of in states and out states are given by this net, these networks of lines, okay? So, the cor correct expression uh, for the S matrix should be, uh, because the, for, the S, for the S matrix to satisfy the usual unitarity condition, we need to normalize the state. So the correct one should be like a disk, uh, disk four point function s divided by these norms, uh, these networks of lines which compute the norm of the state. Okay? And as you can see, the, the, the numerator is just the disk uh, correlation function and it has a usual crossing symmetry property. However, uh, important point here is the denominator actually depends on whether you view this process in this way or in this way, in the horizontal way. And so the crossing symmetry relates uh, the two picture uh, which are related by viewing this, uh, which are related by rotating this uh, scattering process by 90 degrees. And that basically changes uh, how we, you view this diagram, like in this way or this way. So because, of, because the numerator depends on the channel uh, we consider, uh, it leads to modified crossing uh, equation, modified crossing equation, and then a modified crossing, sorry, the, the factor that the goes into the modified crossing is precisely given by the square root of these networks of lines. And you can evaluate these networks of line, again, using fusion category, and then that is going to uh, give you precisely the ratio of quantum dimension that we saw earlier. 
okay? So this is the physical derivation of the, uh, well, I wouldn't say proof, but this is at least a physical derivation of the modified crossing. Okay, so let's move on to the conclusion. So, so this is basically one, well, two equation summary of, my, of what I just said. So the crossing symmetry gets modified, uh, and the, modif the factor that goes into the mo modified crossing is, can be computed by fusion category, and it's given by the networks of lines. And so, and the main message is that in, uh, in series, in one plus one dimension, which have uh, categorical symmetries, uh, that often lead to modified crossing symmetry, which were missed in the literature in the past. And physically, it comes from the corrections to the norm of in and out states due to topological quantum field theory dynamics, which govern the IR, uh, like a low energy. So today I only looked at, like, uh, explained one particular example, but there are many other examples, like, uh, for example, for higher minimal models and also, like, uh, some other deformation of the tree critical easing model. Actually, for this model, like, uh, it was a, there was an interesting history because, like, uh, in the literature, there are three, like, uh, mutually disagreeing pro proposal about what the S matrix of this theory is, and our argument uh, supports uh, the conjecture made by these authors. And I should also mention that a slightly similar modified crossing symmetry was observed in churn simon matter theory in two plus one dimension uh, by these author. Uh, but the difference from our case is that uh, in their case, like uh, the particles that you are scattering are anion, so it was not too much shocking that it, it exhibits some weird property. And in particular, uh, anions obey, uh, famously anions have non-trivial braiding. But in our example, the braiding is not important uh, because it's, first of all, because it's one plus one D. And, and furthermore, uh, topological quantum field theory degrees of freedom is more hidden. So in this theory, like uh, you start with the trans simon uh, theory, so it's kind of obvious that there is a non-trivial topological quantum field theory. But in our theory, we just started from like a usual tree critical easy model, uh, which is not necessarily obvious that it, it's given by, governed by topological quantum field theory in the IR. So let's also talk about the future direction. So one interesting future direction is to use this modified crossing and then ask what are all possible S matrices which pre satisfy this modified crossing equation and do some kind of bootstrap analysis. And this is actually uh, what we are doing right now. And we, we already have some preliminary result for Fibonacci fusion category. So I don't have time to explain the details of this plot, but we found like a several interesting theory which sits at the cusps of the allowed region. And then those turned out to be uh, interesting integrable field series. And in particular, uh, doing this analysis for Harge uh, fusion categories seems very interesting because like uh, we don't quite know uh, what is the quantum field theory realizing uh, this fusion category symmetry, although like recently there are some uh, proposal uh, by taking the continuum limit of the lattice model. And another interesting direction is to think about higher dimensions, and in particular, uh, in the context of scattering a monopole, uh, scattering fermion electrons against monopole, uh, there are several papers recently which pointed out actually there can be some modification of crossing symmetry. And in particular, these two papers pointed out, like if you, in some certain situation, if you scatter uh, electron against monopole, this, this like a solid line is monopole, uh, the, out, the final state is given by electron attached to some surface defect. But this picture makes sense in this channel, but if you rotate this 90 degrees, then like this picture doesn't quite make sense because you cannot like attach a particle to something in the past. So also here, uh, it is natural to expect that there may, there may be some non-trivial crossing relation, like a non, un, unusual crossing relation. Finally, like uh, I emphasize that like the physical uh, reason why crossing is modified is some non-triviality of the uh, like low energy degrees of freedom, which in this case was governed by topological quantum field theory. And similar non-trivial uh, low energy degrees of freedom, well, actually more complicated non-trivial degrees of freedom shows up uh, in series uh, in electromagnetism or gravity, and it's often known as soft effects or IR effects, and maybe it'll be interesting to ask whether we can learn something about gravity and a gauge theory. Okay, let me end here.
question, please, in comments. <laughs> the square root of the quantum dimension looks like a square root of a roof genus correction to D brain charges. Uh, okay. And, uh, they, which was argued to be actually a wrong, wrong, wrong correction, but it should be replaced by a gamma class. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible that maybe you, you don't need square roots, but some kind of gamma function, which, uh, upon multiplication by a conjugate gamma function, gives you quantum dimension? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, but I, okay, I have nothing to say about it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, other questions, please. Is this modification also relevant for, say, uh, the, the integrable word sheet theories for strings in ADS5 times S5 or ADS3 times S3 times T4 and so on? So, not, well, okay, for ADS5 times S5, I wouldn't expect so, because like a particle that you're scattering is are not really so, uh, like a king's interpolating different vacua. ADS3 times S3, um, probably not, but uh, it might be, like maybe for massless modes, like uh, there might be some, something non-trivial. Other questions? Sorry, Shota, just in the context, do you think it might be applicable of some of the kings that can interpolate on this n equals two minimal Louisville models. C can you say something? Some of the king. sorry, could you repeat? No, no, I mean like the, there are those adjacent king interpolation between adjacent vacua uh -huh. in this uh, sine Louisville or super, which is uh, essentially n equals two Louisville okay. Okay. integral models. Uh, um, but, well, I guess, well, Actually, like uh, one of the example we discuss in the paper are sine Gordon theory. So, so I do expect like uh, if 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 there is a massive deformation and then there is a nice uh, scattering amplitude, then there might be some modification. Yeah, because it would be nice in the context of uh, relation to the Landau Ginzburg series, mm -hmm. which it would be description. But also maybe unrelated question. But do you know uh, there is a question of this construction? of the analytic kind of analytic bootstrap for higher d simplices, like going beyond tetrahedron. Uh, do uh, you think, do you, do are you think? Are talking about like a high, d, d simplex, high, like higher fusion categories? Yeah, yeah, exa so if, that, okay. if they are involved there, or that you can go beyond be, okay, tetrahedron. Certainly, well, in one plus one D, no, but like uh, maybe, well, I guess like uh, if you want to start talking about higher dimensional scattering, yeah. then uh, that might play an important role. But so uh, you, yeah, I, we don't we don't quite know at the moment. So this cr modified crossing there is not uh, is not is not understood at the moment, right? In higher D, well, there is a, this result by uh, Minwala and others, uh, which uh, also uses like a various like uh, data of the this Chern Simon theory. Um, but uh, the argument is doesn't look quite the same as ours, uh, it's probably important to understand the relation between the two. I see, because the point was like in this context of Sergei, uh, Sergei von Stroganov, which is like a forest simplex probably, mm -hmm. then this crossing is not known and that mm -hmm. would be very important. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, can I ask uh, what other systems you've done these calculations for? Uh, in particular, if you've done any for uh, systems with twisted Hilbert spaces? Okay, yeah, so, right. So we do expect that this modification of S matrix affects the spectrum of the, uh, like, a, of the peri like a finite size system with twisted boundary condition. And we can, in principle, study it using what's called thermodynamic beta and that's, and the computation is like a right, what we are doing right now. Thank you. Uh, one thing wasn't completely clear to me. Mm -hmm. It's very intuitive that your picture with the disk and the lines is has crossing in, is a normalization that gives complete crossing symmetry. But is that something that you can really prove, or is it just that intuitively that's the one that should have crossing symmetry? 
Right. Uh, right. It's not some. Yeah, I think the numerator there. Yeah. Looks like it has crossing symmetry, right. but is there is there a completely crystal clear argument? Well, I wouldn't say we have a complete completely crystal clear clear argument. Yeah, it's more like intuitive level. It does seem intuitively that it should yeah. be the right one. Other questions or comments? If not, uh, let's thank speaker again. <laughs> Thank you.